And I actually talked about maybe getting some of the authors, which you'll see in uh, the, the documentary on screen tonight. And I did reach out to a couple, one got back to me and that, that will be a follow-up discussion. Uh, but obviously the events that's happened in the last 10, 11 days have precipitated some of the, maybe the thoughts or, or, or things that are going on, but understand that this is a, a historical discussion which I think Mordecai says better than anybody could possibly say in, in my closing discussions with them, which I have on video, but Mordecai, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute, we're, we're gonna stop the video and, and ask you to speak live if you can. Um, but again, it's a, an historical document of what transpired leading up to the 1948 liberation of Israel and the war that proceeded. Uh, what I will ask you to do is make sure to turn your volumes up on your TV as loud as you can go. Um, we, we, we down, I, like I was saying, joking earlier, I have four versions of this movie that I paid for, but the best way to stream it is through YouTube and YouTube volume isn't great. So let's make sure you turn your volumes all the way up when I'm done talking, throw, throw them to hundred and you'll hear the video perfectly. Uh, as I was researching the program, we thought it would be exciting to find someone who might've actually been involved in the creation of the state of Israel. We found that person with Mordecai and uh, Zalmanov. Mordecai currently lives in the Heritage Point, which I had the opportunity to go visit, and uh, what a beautiful place that was. It's the Jewish home for aging in Mission Viejo. In 1948, he served in the Israeli Air Force and worked on radar. This was predating all of this, so his goal was to be an engineer. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in Israel for three years. He lasted a lot longer and then left a lot later and became an engineer. And we will go ahead and show that in a second. As we prepare for the video with Mordecai, the, the, the audio wasn't great. Um, I was using an iPad. And so uh, I had to edit some of it. My daughter, who wants to be in journalism, will be afforded the opportunity to go back down to Mission Viejo. And Mordecai, we're going to interview again. Uh, with full-on audio and all that type of stuff. But we, we have what we need here to be effective. And I just want to say thank you, Mordecai, for all that you represent, all that you've done, and everything you're doing today being here. You are awesome. And I think we all, in advance of even seeing the video, just a huge round of applause to you. So thank you. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and sh uh, share the video. So, Alon, do I have sharing? Yes, I do. And here we go. And Mordecai, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause it at one point where I'm gonna ask you to jump in if that's okay. So, but we're we're gonna start now, and then we'll go from there. Mordecai grew up like anyone else, wanting the best for his family and everyone around him. Unfortunately situations in Palestine did not lend itself to that opportunity. As a result, at a very young age, Mordecai joined Leahy with the opportunity to serve Israel and the future opportunity of Jerusalem as a part of Israel moving forward. This is his story, period. Looking forward to sharing with you. Here is Mordecai being accepted as part of Lehi. No simple feat, let alone. After leaving Lehi and given the opportunity to join the IDF, Mordecai did as such. But without thought, he brought the values of Lehi to IDF with the purpose of maintaining Israel's sovereignty while at the same time liber liberating Jerusalem. This is where Mordecai joined the IDF, taking with him the strength and knowledge he had accordingly to be a successful IDF.
candidate as well as comrade in the Air Force, as evident by his hat. Throughout the interview, Mordecai was so proud of this hat, as so are we. We talked a lot about the importance of independence, and here you go. This picture could be any of us. Remember that. So, Mordecai, I, I, I have what I wanted to say, but I would love, if you remember the last question I asked you when I, I, I interviewed you, I said, you're going to have a lot of people on this screen, which you do. And the question I asked you was, was what would you want to say to them? Do you remember that? And would you mind repeating it? Yes, I remember. Can you hear me? I can, we can hear you. In order for you to hear me, I have to scream. <laughs> we can hear you now. Because I'm screaming. Scream. <laughs> Scream back to the microphone. The, there you go. I know you probably can imitate me. I realize my voice is is low, so I have to increase the volume for my mouth. Now, do you want to know? We want to, we want to know your story. Please talk. Your words of wisdom to future generations. Well, I think they have to learn history because history repeats itself. And if they will be aware of what happened, they will be able to, to prevent future events like that. So it's very important to teach young kids the history of the Jewish nation. No, nothing comes easy. And the way to do it is by getting a good education and to remember all these cases. Unfortunately, I see a lot of young people who are ignorant in knowing what really happens. Learn your history. And Mordecai, while we have you online, would there be anything else you would like to share about leading up to the 48 war? I remember talking to you specifically about the night you went to bed, knowing that not everyone would wake up. And would you mind talking about that again? Oh, the microphone. The United Nations voted to, to let Israel become a nation. I really didn't care what the United Nations is doing because we had our own plan. So I, I went to sleep. It didn't make a difference to me whatever the result would be things would change anyway. Around midnight, I believe it was, I was awakened for a very uh, strong, high vo volume of noises. And I went down to, to the street to find out what's happening. And people were singing and dancing and celebrating because the, the United Nations voted to let Israel to become a state. I remember very, very much the, that, that I was standing at the side and, and thinking how many of these people that are now dancing will be around in a year. In, incredible. What a thank you for everything you've done, Mordecai. I think we're ready, Alon. 
unless Mark, any other last words, we'd love to hear from you. And, and like I said, we're going to interview you with the right equipment so we everyone can hear your voice because that's what this is all about, hearing your voice. Is there anything else you would like to say to us, please? Anything else you would like to say to us as a group? Oh, a little hard to hear you. Can we put the microphone up? There we go. We have to pay a lot of attention to what's happening, happening now in the world. Israel may be under pressure to, to give away part of their independence. And I hope it's not going to happen. So we have to stick as a group together and, and be aware of what's going on in the world. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mordecai, for all you've done. We will make sure that your entire story is told to all of us. Uh, without further ado, Alon, the floor is yours. Let's start this great movie. I do recommend, like I said, turn the volume all the way up because it's a little hard to hear. Mordecai, I think you'll love this video because um, it does show a lot of history from where you're about. So thank you. Great, thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Mordecai, and welcome everyone again. I am going to share my screen to uh, be able to share the video. If for whatever reason you're not hearing it, please, I actually already asked Marla Schwartz to do this, so if for some reason the volume is, uh, the, not that the volume is low, because we, we know the volume is low on the video, but if for some reason you're not hearing it at all, Please, please, please send me an immediate text and we'll start over again. We'll, we'll get it started right at the beginning. All right. So I hope you all enjoy the film. And uh, here we go. Visualize two little beaten up airplanes on this abandoned runway in uh, Brindisi, Italy. We had to travel a thousand miles to Israel. We were reading every day about the convoys in Israel being trapped in the hills. In one case, it was a convoy of 40 doctors that were killed. It was desperation time in Palestine. There was food to be dropped, ammunition to be dropped, and they only had a few Piper Cubs. So these airplanes were critical to get over there. We took out the seats in the back and put in a big rubber tank full of fuel with a pipe going to the wing tank. We were flying Molotov cocktail. We didn't have life rafts, no operational radios. We were in a hurry. 
I saw some beautiful wildflowers right by the runaway. I saw Lou jump out of his airplane and pick flowers. I wanted to kill him, but uh, I was able to control myself. Just off the edge of the airstrip was a cliff. And the airplane just sunk like this. Eleven and a half hours of watching that single propeller go round and round and round. Never saw land, never saw a ship, never saw an airplane, nothing but just water. It was the dumbest thing we ever did. Flying 11 hours over water with a single engine aircraft. The only person I know that ever did that was Lindbergh. Finally, we made a landfall at Natanya, turned south. We circled the Tel Aviv airport. It was nothing but a dirt strip. It had no lighting except what they call goosenecks. And after about 45 minutes, we were able to come in the land. These two little airplanes were the biggest thing that they had in Israel. The very next morning, they were already dropping supplies to the kibbutzim. I handed the flowers to the first woman I saw. Well, that's Lou. I learned afterwards that we were the first ones to arrive. That was the beginning of the Israeli Air Force. It's a day they've been waiting for. It's a day of days for these sailors and for the best reason in the world. They're the first group to be released by the Navy. Thanks, mates, for a job well done. After I returned from three years of war, I was in Minot, North Dakota, partners in a used car and truck business. Money, girlfriends, cars, the whole enchilada. I really wasn't very concerned about Palestine. I never went to Hebrew school. My mother had to drag me kicking and screaming to get me bar mitzvah. I grew up in an age of very virulent anti-Semitism. People like Father Coughlin. We believe in Christ's principle of love your neighbor as yourself, and with that principle, I challenge every Jew in this nation to tell me that he does not believe in it. It was tough. When I was walking home from school, we used to get it up, down, and sideways. Christ killer, and Sheeny, and Dirty Jew, and the whole bit. We try to ignore it, but uh, you just couldn't. It, it was part of your psyche. They'd surround me, and the guy would hit me from the back, and I'd turn around and immediately. I realized by the time I was about 13 years old that in order for me to survive, I gotta get very strong. So I wrote a wave to a guy called Charles Atlas, a dollar bill. By the time I was 15 years old, nobody was beating me up. I graduated high school in April. End of April, I went to the recruiting office and there were guys lined up and there was a guy sitting at the desk. I filled out the form. 
course, it said their uh, religion, Jewish. He looked up at me and he says, Marine Corps is a tough outfit. Do you think you could make it? I looked down at him and I says, if you made it, I can make it. I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. I used to come back from a battle with black eyes and I walk into the house and my father said, what did you do to the other guy? My old man was a tiger. We didn't have cars. Uh, I had friends who had bicycles and we'd go across highways and everything in our bikes. I lived near Newark Airport. We would watch airplanes land and watch the pilots and admire them. So I was always interested in aviation. When we were kids, I used to go to Coney Island with my friends. I would go on the Cyclone or the Thunderbolt when I could afford it. It was probably 10 or 15 cents a ride. It's that rush of being frightened and loving it at the same time. That was my introduction to taking risks and wanting to be a pilot. We kept a kosher home out of respect for my grandparents, but I didn't like being a Jew. I don't think you could get a job in the fire department or a police department in New York if you were Jewish. I didn't deny my Judaism, but I wasn't happy about being Jewish. What changed me simply was knowing what Hitler did to the Jews to be murdered, six million. I didn't understand Zionism, but I knew what had happened in Europe in the concentration camps and the refugees who were trying to find some place to live. And also, the British intercepting them on the high seas and putting them behind barbed wire in Germany. I thought there should be something done about this. Europe's displaced persons are on the last lap of a journey toward freedom. Their eyes turn toward the horizon, seeking the shoreline of the promised land. Off in the distance, a British destroyer bars away. So near and yet so far. Palestine is still a promise. At the end of the war, there was massive pressure on the British who control Palestine to allow Jews to immigrate in, in large numbers to Palestine, which is something the British government just refuses to do. Because they know if they're going to have a future in the region, they have to have the goodwill of the entire Arab world. And they will not have that if they allow massive immigration of Jews to Palestine. The British realized that they could not achieve a compromise between the warring clans in Palestine, the Jews and the Arabs. And they understood they couldn't remain here indefinitely. So the British in February 47 said, we'll hand Palestine and the whole problem back to the world community. And the United Nations came up with a partition proposal, and the idea being to partition the country into two halves, two states, one for the Jews of Palestine and one for the Arabs of Palestine. The Jews accepted the partition resolution of 29 November 1947, the Arabs rejected, they want all of Palestine for themselves. The United Kingdom, abstain. The United States, yes. Paraguay, yes. While the vote is being tallied, people are counting in their head. 
And when they realize the two-thirds majority has been reached, there is such a cry of joy. Their dreams of statehood have finally been granted. The resolution was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstention. The people here were overwhelmed. Everybody was dancing and singing in the street. I was just one sad man. His name was David Ben Gurion. I stand on his side when he looked at the dancing people, and he says, "Well, today the dance, tomorrow." Their blood will be spilled. And so I went. There was violence from the time of the partition through the spring of 1948, a kind of civil war between Jews and Palestinian Arabs. This is when Jerusalem was besieged. It's when the state of Israel looked like it might never emerge. Large numbers of Palestinians turned into refugees or were displaced from their homes as a result of the fighting. In a few cases, there were expulsions. And then others, their leaders, told them to leave. But basically, they fled in face of the flail of war. After the partition vote, the British announced that they were going to leave Palestine on May 15, 1948. And that started a ticking clock. Everybody knew that come May 15th, there would be a vacuum. And so for the Jews, they knew they had to be organized and ready to fight a war with the neighboring Arab armies who were preparing to invade as soon as the British left. The Egyptians have an air force with several dozen Spitfires and a few other military aircraft. The Jews in Palestine had a very small air arm called the Haganah Air Service. The air service was insignificant and didn't have military aircraft. Ben Gurion called me and he says, look, we have a little bit of rifles, a little bit of machine guns. We don't have planes, we don't have tanks. And unless we shall get some arms, we are lost. And he says, I'm going to the United States to mobilize the money. Ben-Gurion's view was that the US really would be the place to go for everything. American money, World War II surplus equipment, either rotting in fields or being sold at scrap prices. Jewish veterans who had current military skills. I got a letter from a friend of mine at TWA. And the letter just simply said, if you're interested in flying munitions to Palestine, call this number in New York and ask for Swifty. Just like that. So what the hell, I called the number. Livingston, where the hell are you? Been waiting a week for you. I said, waiting for me? He said, yeah, we need you right away. The minute I got this, I knew my whole life would be different. I just knew it. I'm in Hollywood. There was a Palestinian general who was going to speak at the temple that night. I went up to him and I said, look, I know there's going to be a war there and I'm a fighter pilot and I want to go there. He said, well, I don't know anything about it. Because, you know, it wasn't like a newspaper had joined the Haganah. It was illegal, of course. Although Truman had been a strong supporter of the Jewish state, the State Department had become very ambivalent about partition. 
they thought that a Jewish state could not successfully be established, that the Jews would be overrun by the Arabs. And so the U.S. Uh, took a number of steps to make it clear that anybody who tried to go to Palestine to fight would lose their citizenship. And that there would be no exportation of American war material to Palestine. The Americans took the lead in establishing an embargo of arms uh, to the entire Middle East. Our problem was how to break the embargo. We used every possible way. Ingenuity, connections, smuggling, everything. Because it was a matter of life and death. This is when a pivotal figure named Al Schwimmer stepped in. Al Schwimmer was, a, in many ways, the founder of the Israel Air Force. He began his career as a flight engineer. It was Al Schwimmer, the American, who, when he got involved in this enterprise, suggested you're not going to win a war against the Arab states if you don't have an air force. Ben-Gurion and he thought very similarly. I get a phone call on a Sunday morning from Al Schwimmer. He gave me an envelope with $5,000, sent me down to the War Surplus Administration. At that time, the desert was filled with airplanes. And if you're a veteran, you can buy one. So the airplane cost to build about $175,000. For $5,000, I became owner of a C-46. Schwimmer purchased a dozen or so of these C-46s, two or three of the Constellations, and got an operation established in, in California. Essentially, from scratch, he created an airline, and ultimately the nucleus of Israel's transport squadron. The important point at this time was to recruit crews we had these airplanes, but no one to fly them. My first job was not flying. It was scouring the stolen records of New York Air National Guard rosters, looking for Jewish-sounding names with pilot status. I got this phone call from New York apprising me that Israel was going to declare itself a state that they had purchased some airplanes, but they had no one to fly them. My father was a stunt pilot, daredevil flyer. He was very swaggery and macho. He was like a, um, Indiana Jones, kind of, you know? I mean, he had that kind of personality. After the war, the airlines were not hiring Jewish pilots. So an opportunity to fly for a good cause was just grand. I believe that the reason he went was, was purely because he was so passionate about it. He felt like it was destiny. He said yes almost immediately and called four friends who all said yes. I was working as a flying instructor in Philadelphia on the Delaware River. I was going to make inquiries to see whether I could go to Israel. I was invited to New York, met with Al Schwimmer. It was supposed to be hush-hush. I got a form, were you in World War II in what capacity? So I filled it out, I was a fighter pilot. Boom, a couple of days later, I started getting phone calls and telegrams. Meet a guy with a flower in his lapel on West 57th Street. These clandestine operations to recruit pilots and procure arms were centered in a hotel in which the Copa Cabana was located. And Frank Sinatra used to perform there. In fact, he once volunteered to pass money to buy illegal weapons. They asked me how much I wanted to get paid, and I said, I don't need any pay. I thought I'd be home in a month or two. I really thought we would lose. 
You know, you're talking about 600,000 Jews and 50 million Arabs surrounding I don't see how they could possibly survive. I said, Mom, I'm going to Palestine. She said, you're not going. Under no circumstances are you going. And I said, I'm going. My father said nothing. I know he would have gone. I was risking my citizenship and also jail time. I didn't give a shit. I was going to help the Jews out. I was going to help my people out. Jewishness to me didn't mean anything. I was an American. But the idea that Jews were going to fight, I found exciting. It's about time. My father, I had an argument with him about it. I was always arguing with him. I, he was always telling me I, I wasn't a good Jew. And I said, I'm going to go and risk my life to be a good Jew. You don't have to kill yourself to be a good Jew. I told my mother I was going to work for a cargo airline. In World War II, she had received a telegram from the War Department that I had domestic in action. I didn't want to put her through that again. My mother threw herself on the floor and started crying hysterically, and I almost didn't make it out the door. I had just made up my mind that nothing was going to stop me. I couldn't live with myself if I didn't do this. Part of my family wound up at Auschwitz, my grandmother and my cousins. I felt that the remnants had a right to life and some chance of happiness. The alternative is too hard for me to envision the possibility of what the Arabs could have done. And they talked about the fact that what Hitler did will be nothing compared to what we're going to do. Schwimmer had to figure out a way to get the planes out of the US. You couldn't take them to Palestine because the British were still there and on high alert for arms smugglers but you couldn't leave them in the U.S. because of the arms embargo. So they would have to hopscotch around the globe to get as close to Palestine as possible. This idea was hatched to turn these Jewish planes into the nucleus of a fake airline. There was a former Air Force major who was friends with the nephew of the Panamanian president. So we were Linnea Serie de Panama, which was a phony. You have these planes lining up on the taxiway to take off, and they're very well aware that this embargo is taking effect. And you have these treasury agents, or T-men as they were called in the day, show up, and there's a confrontation with some of the pilots who are getting ready to take off. Swifty said, these are foreign registered aircraft. No, they're not. They're US. Swifty says, wait a minute. Goes in the hangar, comes out with a mechanic with a can of blue paint. The mechanic gets up on one of the side, sides of the C-46s and he prints LAPSA, L-A-P-S-A, Linear City de Panama, sloppy letters all bleeding down. Swifty says to the guy, okay, now they're foreign registered. And the guy says, well, I still want to let you go. And he, he said to the team man, you want to stop us? Shoot us down. <laughs> Panama, we had the run of the town. We settled on a favorite place, which I remember was called Tierra Feliz, Happy Land. We bought a Buick sedan. My friend Norman Muntz and I bought white suits. And we would ride around and pick up girls. We were young, good looking, had hair. We had a lot of testosterone, and we didn't want to waste it. What else can I say? We got out of Panama. We had to go through the South Atlantic, so we landed at Natal, Brazil. Then we took off, got to Casablanca. Payoffs all over the place. 
And then we headed out, landed at Rome. Rome was headquarters of the Haganah, and they were gathering pilots there. We were all young guys, flight jackets. And Rome was a wild place at that time. Beautiful women with beautiful boobs. And I'm having a hell of a time there. And I meet Buzz Burling. They introduced me to him. Buzz Burling was Canada's leading World War II ace. He was the Falcon of Malta. He was the kind of person who single-handedly had the potential to alter the course of the war. The Arabs wanted him. He wasn't Jewish, but he made it known that he wanted to, to fight for the Jews. For him, going to Palestine was going to get him back to his glory days. And uh, in Rome, while other pilots like uh, Giddy Lickman were out uh, running around and picking up women, uh, he was in his hotel room practicing with his model planes. One day, Buzz Burling says, I'm going to fly a Norseman tomorrow. He says, you want to go up? I said, sure. Just prior to that, I had met this lovely young Italian girl. I spent the night with her, and she wanted me to, and I wanted to stay longer. I called up Buzz Burling. I said, Buzz, I can't make it today. I have a young lady here. So he says, I understand. So he got another guy. I think his name was Cone. Unfortunately, that particular plane had caught on fire and crashed. He and his co-pilot uh, were killed instantly. There was some thought that his plane had been sabotaged to prevent him from ever making it to Palestine. Perhaps some of the women that the soldiers were carousing with were spies. No one will ever really know. There was only one country in the world willing to break the embargo and sell arms and aircraft to Israel. Czechoslovakia needed Yankee dollars. The Zionist movement had millions of American dollars because of American Jewish contributions to the cause. The Czechoslovakians made available an airfield. The Israelis could base all of these transport planes that they had smuggled out of the US and down to Panama. The Israelis were able to set this up as essentially a remote Israeli base. When I met these people in New York, they asked me what I flew, and I told them in combat I flew the Thunderbolts P-47, and the Mustang, the P-50. Oh, he says, we've got them, we've got them. I said, great, wonderful, I thought. Anyhow, that was not correct. <laughs> they were training us in an ME-109. The Messerschmitt was a famous German fighter in World War II. The Germans during the war had built a Messerschmitt factory in Czechoslovakia. The Czechs took it over after the war and, and continued to churn out planes. The factory that made the engines apparently had burned down, so they had to take an engine out of a bomber, Mickey Mouse it, to fit into this little 4,000-pound fighter. This thing was put together from junk. Different propeller, different engines, and so on. Messer shit, I called it. I was amazed that it could get it off the ground. And most of the time, it couldn't. We lost a lot of planes on takeoffs and landings, a lot. They gave us uh, flight clothing, blue suede with the Nazi uh, wings, Luftwaffe wings on it, which I immediately took off. I remember uh, sitting in the cockpit of my ME-109, wearing a German uniform, German helmet, a German parachute. What's a nice Jewish boy from St. Paul doing in a place like this? The irony of it did not escape any of us. The hour of 
of destiny approaches in Palestine. Last pictures from Jerusalem before the end of the British mandate show a city tensely quiet, barricaded and armed to the teeth. Eastward, the Arab Legion poised for invasion on the Transjordan border. The rarely photographed King Abdullah reviewed a brigade of reinforcements from Iraq. How far would the Arabs go to prevent the partitioning of the Holy Land? On the 12th of May, 1948, Ben-Gurion summoned his chief commanders to a session and asked them what's going to happen if we declare a state. On the 12th of May, he asks them, and um, Igael Yadin, the head of uh, Haganah operations, tells them the chances are 50-50. That is, we don't know whether we're going to win against the Arab states if they invade. The Arab media did talk about killing the Jews, destroying the Jews, throwing Jews into the sea. And the Jews absorbed this. And that motivated them in the sense of fearing that if they lost the war, there would be a second Holocaust. And that the world would not intervene on their behalf. <laughs> Ben-Gurion declared the State of Israel on the Friday afternoon, the 14th of May, 1948. I was a volunteer, and our mission was to fly over Jordan and to give the Army High Command an estimate of the strength of the Jordanian army that was invading Israel. It really was a very grim situation. The armored cars and the troops and the trucks were nose to tail for miles coming in from Jordan. This evening, the invasion. Arab armies are pouring in. Their tanks have already crossed the borders and the frontier settlements have helped the first onslaught of the fighting forces of the organized Arab armies. Saturday morning, Tel Aviv was bombed. The Jews are holding their ground in the country in spite of the fact that they have been outnumbered by the Arabs, and the Arabs have come much better equipped with heavy arms than the Jews have in their possession. Jews who are fighting in Palestine, the state of Israel, are fighting for the only thing that they have in their possession. It means life or death to them. The Egyptians bomb sites inside Israel. They attack the central bus station in Tel Aviv, killing several dozen people. The Jews actually have nothing with which to respond to these Arab air attacks. They have no proper air force, and psychologically, they feel very vulnerable. In Czechoslovakia, three of us were in the commandant's office. The Czech commander was there, and I told him, I said, look, we have to go back right now. But he says, you haven't finished your flying course yet. Can't wait. We're going. And they say, you're on your way to go to Israel. I say, how the hell am I going to get to Israel? In an airplane. We set up what was known as the Air Transport Command, ATC. These aircraft, which Swimmer had smuggled out of America, started flying equipment to Israel. They would bring Messerschmitts. We would dismantle these airplanes. One fuselage would fit into the C-46, plus a wing. The rest was filled with boxes, which contained machine guns and ammunition. Over this fuselage, they take the wings, 
and over the wings, they stick meat, giddy lickman. As I flew into Israel, I had the greatest feeling I've ever had in my life. I'll never forget it. And that was to land in my country. You're gonna think this is corny, but I had been there before. I had this deja vu. Maybe I was with Joshua at Jericho or someplace because everything started to look familiar. I remember the, the smell of the citrus groves. Then coming into the hangar and seeing all these people in uniform. These are Jews? My cynicism vanished very rapidly, I'll tell you that. The first four Messerschmitts arrived a week or so after the war started. They had to be assembled. And at that point, they were truly a secret weapon. They were being assembled in one hangar, and the Egyptians came over and bombed the other hangar. Got a little bit lucky there. They'd been put together, but it wasn't clear how successfully they had been put together, and they couldn't be tried out. Their first flight was going to be a combat mission. At first, there was the thought of using them against the Jordanians, but then a frantic call came in for assistance in the south. About 5 o'clock, Shimon Avidan rushed up in the jeep. He says, look, six miles from where we're standing now at the airbase is the whole Egyptian army of about 10,000 men, and we have nothing to stop them. He says, if you don't go now, They'll be in Tel Aviv in the morning, and there's no Israel. The pilots were actually two Palestinians, Azer Weitzman, Modi alone, a South African named Eddie Cohen, and Lou Lennart. And Lennart led the mission. This was the Air Force of Israel. These four people and four junk airplanes. I'm climbing at 6,000 feet in the climbing turn. Modi alone realized that I wasn't sure where it is, and he went like this. I looked down, and as far as the eye could see, the Egyptian army was there on the road. Tanks, trucks, artillery, everything. I looked there. I saw the enemy that came to destroy us. I looked back and saw the people of Israel were behind me. I just did a quick schmice royal, even though I'm not religious. Turned the airplane upside down because the dive bomb, the steeper the dive, the more accurate is the hit. I dropped my bombs and then I stayed down, strafing what they call a clover leaf, like this. They had machine guns firing through the propellers, like in World War I. Timing mechanisms didn't always function properly, and that some of the pilots were shooting off the propellers. This is what we suspect happened with Eddie Cohen. We were like a band of brothers. It's like a piece of your heart breaks off.
That evening, our intelligence intercepted a radio message from the commander of the Egyptian army. And I quote, we are heavily attacked by enemy aircraft and we are scattering. The commander of that column decided to dig in and not to advance further, thinking that this was the vanguard of a much larger Jewish air force and that there was going to be much stiffer opposition if he continued to just sort of rumble through the desert in broad daylight. It was probably the single most important flight in the whole Israeli Air Force. They stopped the Egyptians cold. There was a second airstrike which followed immediately after on the 30th of May by an American pilot against the Iraqis. The Iraqi army in the 48th war was the largest of the Arab armies involved. They struck westward into Israeli territory and controlled, had occupied the northern west bank. And this is where the Israeli Messerschmitts attacked them. Two pilots were on patrol, Asa Weizmann and Milton Rubenfeld. This is from my father's debrief. Open fire with MG and cannons on Tolcom Police Station and dropped the second bomb on Police Street. Made a 90 degree turn to north, attacked four tanks, registered hits, tracer, on all four of them, zero distance. This helped persuade the Iraqis to hunker down and not attack Israeli territory thereafter. No flak until hit right over tanks by two cannon shells, one in left wing and one in belly. Left wing crumbled up, climbed above clouds, all instruments gone. He realized that he wouldn't be able to get back to his base. He bailed out on the beach. He saw a number of kibbutzniks come in with rifles. Now, bear in mind that nobody in Israel knew that we had acquired combat aircraft. All they knew was that they were being attacked with the Egyptian aircraft. They thought he was an Arab, and so they were shooting at him. He didn't speak Hebrew. He had his arms up. He started yelling uh, Yiddish words and the names of Jewish food. Shabbos gefilte fish. Gefilte fish, gefilte fish. Matzah, Pesach. Gefilte fish. Gefilte fish. So they, they stopped with the pitchforks. Fighter Squadron was at that time made up entirely of foreign volunteers. With two notable exceptions. Modi Alon and Azer Weizmann. Modi Alon was a very cool customer. Modi Alon was a good pilot, totally fearless. One day, Mori calls us all in and said, we want to have an insignia and we want to have a number for our squadron. I said, what's the number? He said, 101. We want them to think we have 100 squadrons. They were sitting in a bar in Tel Aviv, and someone said, you know, we need a, a logo for the fighter squadron. I said, let's call ourselves the Macha Mavit, Angels of Death. There were two veterans from California who volunteered together. Their names were Bob Vickman and Stan Andrews. They met on the campus of UCLA, and they were both incredibly talented artists. 
Stan and Bob literally got out a cocktail napkin and they drew this logo of the angel of death with flight goggles. And that emblem's on Israeli F-16s today. Eight o'clock in the morning, I'm not sure the time. I feel somebody tap me on the shoulder. Get ready, you're gonna fly. I'm gonna fly what? You're gonna fly the ME. And so I said, okay, fine. I get into the cockpit and I'm looking around. Where the fuck is this? Where is this? I don't know where this is. Before I flew a fighter aircraft in the American Air Force, I got at least 100 hours of intensive instruction. Here, I got 35 minutes, and I'm taxiing out the airplane. Marty says, let's take off. So I give it the throttle, I take off. And I'm trying to follow him through this mist and I can barely see him. We see below us four Egyptian Spitfire. I'm looking for the gun sight switch. I'm looking for everything. I can find nothing. Muddy rolls over, and I roll over with my thumb up my toughest because I can't shoot the gun. He makes a pass, shoots at him, and they break off and they go into the mist. We got 35 minutes fuel in these Verstunken airplanes. Finally, I find the gun switch, I find all the switches. I see one of them break out. He sees me now, so he makes a half-assed turn. I drove up as tough as and pulled the trigger, and I see pieces fall out into the mist. And I come back to the base, they say there's an airplane that crashed. That was the first kill. A promise of peace for at least four weeks comes to the Holy Land. But almost until the very hour set for the truce to begin, grim, real war still in progress. Jews held in fortified parts of New Jerusalem and Tel Aviv while Arabs advanced through other parts of Palestine. That first phase ended successfully in the sense that the Egyptians had been stopped in the south and there still was a Jewish state. And Israel geared up knowing that there would be a round two. Israel was far better organized than the Arab states and knew how to use and did use the truces which the United Nations had forced on the sides to rearm, resupply, reorganize its troops far better than the Arab states. Volunteers continued to make their way to the country. These volunteers from outside of the land are called Mahal. Machal is a Hebrew acronym, Mitnadvei Chutz La'aretz, Volunteers from Abroad. The Machal was a truly global enterprise. There are about 3,500 of them from throughout the world. Many were not Jewish, and about 190 of the Machal were volunteers for the Air Force. They came from Canada, from England, from South Africa. Everyone came for a different reason. The arrival in Israel of large groups of volunteers, morale-wise, had a tremendous impact. The Israelis understood that they weren't alone, if you like, in contrast to Jews in the Holocaust who did feel alone and were alone. They had expertise that very few people in the Air Force had. Ground crew, radio technicians. Each individual Machal participant had the potential to contribute to the war effort far above and beyond even their experience in World War II. 
during truce periods, they took us into this little hotel called the Park Hotel, and they were partying. Beautiful girls, guys, soldiers. And I figured this is a great war. We were notorious. We weren't looking for trouble, but we were always looking for action. The fighter squadron had these red baseball caps. Any time a bar owner saw their caps coming, he'd call the police. We used to steal a Jeep because we had no vehicles. We called that moonlight requisitioning. Somebody would come along with a tow chain and hook onto the Jeep and pull it out to the base, and that's how we got our vehicles. Somehow or other, Muddy Alon was able to keep us together. We had to put up with a lot of nonsense. One night we got so bombed out that we took a big jar or something and threw it against the mirror. <laughs> Somebody took out the back bar at the, at the Park Hotel, which Muddy made us pay for collectively. These are some of the shtick we used to pull. We used to pull all kinds of stuff. I love Giddy. <laughs> He's uh, special. Leon Franco was legitimate. Torpedo bomber pilot in the Navy. He won the highest medal, the Navy Cross, handsome. We were all stuppers, but he was the primo stupper. I had a couple of girlfriends there, and I don't know if it was my looks or my status or what it was that attracted them, but uh, we got along very well. And uh, that's about all I can, I can say about that. <laughs> Many of the volunteers, most of them, did not speak Hebrew. Many of the Israelis did not speak very good English. Social relations between the two of them could be difficult. I don't think the Israelis were too pleased with us because we swaggered around. For them, it was a different experience. It was a hard life. The economy was not firmly established. There was great poverty there, and there were shortages. And the new state was still absorbing tens of thousands of survivors. I met this girl at the Park Hotel. The conflict arose when it came whether I would settle in Israel. I said, no, I'm a Yankee, an American. I said, well, you're a Jew. I said, well, I can be an American and a Jew, can I? I said, I'm here to help you people. You can help us by helping us grow. I said, I'm helping you become an entity. Isn't that enough? I didn't know then that I was one of them, or I didn't admit it. On the 8th of July, the Egyptians broke the first truce. And then Israel went over to the offensive. The Air Force plan was to have this lightning raid right at the beginning of the next round of fighting to go after the most forward Egyptian base at El Arish and to knock their planes out on the ground. Lou Lennart again headed that mission. Bob Vickman was one of the other pilots. Stan Andrews was to be part of that mission as well. He and Bob were going to fly together. Andrew's plane, as these planes often did, ground looped on takeoff, and he ended up in a cloud of dust. The remaining three planes formed up and went south, but they'd used up valuable fuel while waiting for the Andrew's situation to be sorted out and had to turn back before reaching the target. I'm flying low. 
south, and I saw a troop ship unloading supplies and troops in the port of Gaza. I turned left and came over, and my other two planes followed me, and I dove down on the ship. My number two was hit, an American kid. Bob Dickman's plane plunged into the sea. Stan was devastated by his best friend having gone missing on this mission and committed himself to doing everything in his power to locating Bob, dead or alive. He said, I came here with Bob and I'm not leaving without him. Tragically, he ended up keeping that promise because his plane also crashed and his body was never found. One of Al Schwimmer's great coups was to purchase three B-17 bombers, and he smuggled them out of the country through Florida and managed to get them over to Czechoslovakia. So then there became this great debate, what do we do with these B-17s? Do we just fly them to Israel, and do we actually use them to strike at the Arabs before they've made their way into the country? Egypt had been bombing Israel for all this time. Cairo had never been bombed before. Schwimmer himself had been a, a TWA pilot, and uh, some of the others had been commercial pilots as well. So that when they flew into Cairo, the radio went off from the traffic control tower at the Cairo airport, asking the plane to identify itself. One of the pilots said, oh, this is TWA flight 38 were coming in and they, they turned on the runway lights at the airport for this B-17, which of course strafed and bombed the Cairo area as a result. One bomb fell near King Farouk's palace and psychologically it made a very, very profound impression on the Egyptians. The next day, thousands left Cairo they felt it was too dangerous. And Israel at that point had a real credible bomber force, which nobody else really had. For the third round of fighting, the goal was to displace the Egyptians once and for all from the Negev. We had a contingent of soldiers down there, totally cut off, totally isolated. They had no weapons. You couldn't get in by sea. You, you couldn't truck them in. They had to be flown in. That was Schwimmer's mission. And he put airstrips in, on the sand. We brought them in. We brought every screwdriver in. They would have literally starved to death had it not been for the supplies that were brought in. Really, the, the whole survival of the Negev communities was because of the Air Force. We would take off from Tel Aviv. We'd bring palm optics in, take out wounded, fly them back. These guys were real soldiers who had taken one for the country. Tough guys. A lot of them were refugees, too, by the way, from Europe. They were pleased to have given what they gave for this. I went down and I saw all these kids. Couldn't believe it. They could only be equipped with what we could equip them with. I did have a conversation with a girl, got in a holster. I thought about my, my own sister, my little sister, who was about the same age at the time, packing a gun. Jesus. 
the Arabs, if they were in trouble, they, they could go home and live to fight another day. The Israelis couldn't afford to lose, and they knew it. They were willing to give their lives. October 16th, I remember the day very well. I was heading out over the mega by myself, and I came upon this engagement. I saw an ME-109 right behind a Spitfire knocking chunks off of it. And I looked to the left and saw another Egyptian Spitfire. By the time I pulled around, he was a little speck in the sky halfway to Cairo. And all of a sudden, the engine started running rough. So I looked at the oil gauge in a red zero. Now, in all my years of flying, I had never seen an oil gauge read zero. And then I started smelling smoke. Uh, I said, Leon, you, you better look for a place to come down because you're not going to make it. Just cleared the orange rose, slid forward and went up on its nose and back down on the ground. I got a face full of dirt. I knew I had to go west and north to get away from the Jordanian lines. Off in the distance, coming down the road, I saw a truck with soldiers in it. I knew what had happened to other downed pilots, a couple of them, and uh, I wasn't going to be taken prisoner. I pulled out my revolver. Well, if it's Jordanians, I'm going to take five of them and save the last bullet for myself. From about 50 yards away, I heard Hebrew being spoken. So I jumped out and started waving my arms. By the time I got to the air base, I could see there was an airplane burning. I asked somebody what it was. They said it was one of the pilots it was either Muddy Alon or Azer Weitzman. Azer's parents, they came into my room, hysterical, both of them. Is my son dead? Is my son dead? I said, no, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. It turned out to be Mari Alain. כעבור כמה זמן איזה חזר גם כן, ובא להגיד לי מה קרה. שמחתי, אבל אמרתי, אוי, אבל אני בהיריון, כאילו, איך יכול לקרות גם דבר כזה בזמן שאני בהיריון? לא ידעתי ש... שתהיה אחת מיכל, אחר כך היא נולדה. It was like losing our heart. And as we were leaving the funeral, I was in the back of a Jeep. I started going into shock. And my limbs wouldn't move. My, I, I felt it totally paralyzed. So they took me to a hospital in Jaffa. Then I decided I'd, I'd had enough. We'd gotten some replacement pilots, so I didn't feel like I was leaving the squadron in any kind of jeopardy. Volunteers were always free to leave. The Israelis realized they were going to need as quickly as possible to train the local population to be able to take on this burden themselves. 
Danny Shapiro was a particularly fascinating young Israeli pilot. Some of us were sent to Czechoslovakia to train as soon as possible to fly back to Israel. We heard that some of the volunteers, they left the country, they had families, you know, and they went back. I said to the guys, we will never surrender. We have to study as fast as possible so there will not be another Holocaust. In November, they asked me to go back to Czechoslovakia and train some of the Israeli pilots that were being trained in Czechoslovakia. George Lichter was fearless. He was not afraid to go up time and time again in a plane that everybody else was, was quite fearful of. One day, a guy looks, you know, tough. He said, I'm George Lichter. I came to see who is capable to fly a fighter aeroplane and who is not. In fact, we didn't sleep that night, you know, I was so scared. He flew with me, one flight. He said, do this, turn left, turn right, stall, spin. And I got back. And I made a nice landing. George Richter said, now you brief those guys what to do, what to avoid. The Czechoslovakians agreed to sell a bunch of World War II Spitfires to Israel. The Spitfire could climb like an angel. It was really a great plane. And they asked me to fly with the Spitfires to Israel so they could enter the war right away. We were short two pilots, and I recommended that we take these students. They were basically novices. They were beginners. The more experienced pilots, they spoke to us like if we were going to get killed. They said, it's very dangerous. You don't have any experience flying in bad weather. And I said to Moti, let's keep the mouth shut. They won't put us on the formation if we will say that we are afraid to fly. So I didn't say anything. It was so cold, you know, I was freezing. My hands were freezing. They flew on my wing. Mati on one wing and Danny Shapiro on the other. Once we got into the clouds, it all messed up. I was close to George, and all of a sudden, I lost sight of him because of the clouds. To avoid a collision, I turned slightly to the right to open up the space. All of a sudden, I was alone. I saw my uh, artificial horizon moving, and I'm losing altitude. Somehow he got lost from the group. I went down looking for him. My airspeed was building up. I didn't know how to recover. And I knew, Danny, that's it. You're going to die. I was very concerned, how am I going to find that little speck? And all of a sudden, he saw me much lower, you know, spiraling. I saw George saying, come over, come over. I could see his mouth, come over. He picked me up, and he brought me back. He saved my life. He was sure that we will make it. 
And we made it. We made it. Next day, the Israel army pushed the Egyptian army back. And those Spitfires took a big part. We were really fighting and winning by this time. As a Jew, I now felt proud of being Jewish. The final phase of the war was from the 22nd of December. It was a great battle, and the Air Force threw in everything it had against the Egyptians, the B-17s and the Spitfires and the C-46s. It really was uh, a hell-out effort, you might say. The 48 war ended when the Israelis surrounded the Egyptian army, which was concentrated in the Gaza Strip, forcing the Egyptians to call it quits and to call for an armistice. The United Nations Security Council decreed that the final ceasefire would be on the 7th of January, 1949. The 1948 war was the most historically significant of the Israeli-Arab wars. This was a tremendous blow to the Arab world and is remembered as such to this day. It's also significant because during that war, Palestinian society was essentially crushed and 700,000 Palestinians were displaced from their homes and became refugees. And this is a second consequence of the war. The Palestinian people to this day see it as a catastrophe or in Arabic, a Nakba. It was a very difficult war. Close to 1% of the population were killed, so it was a very, very difficult and extended war. The people who fought in 1948 and brought about the creation of the State of Israel. For most of them, this was the golden moment of their lives. March 14, 1949, it was a big parade. I received my wings. I had tears in my eyes. This was my wish. Long time when I was a kid, now I became a pilot in the Israel Air Force, in my Air Force, in my country. To train a pilot takes years. And there came a group, experienced, volunteers, who risk their lives, who risk their passports, they fought, they trained, they built. It was a godsend. When I came back, my father would boast to his patients and his colleagues about my son who saved Israel. <laughs> Thank you.
It changed my whole life. It, it made me a mensch. I had done something good for once. There was a picture of me standing next to Ben Gurion, my father. He used to cavell. He loved it. My father used to look at me kind of out of the side of it, you know, like this. What's, what is he going to do next? When I went to school, I got terrible grades because I never cracked a book. I know they were both very, very proud. Those were the best days when he built an Air Force. He started an Air Force. During difficult times, did you feel that Israel would survive? Somehow, yes, and I'll tell you why. Israel's an article of faith. I felt more at home in Israel than I did in the United States. I felt this is my home. When I came back with my wife to Israel, we were four couples in one little apartment. We shared everything. Doors were open. I don't remember a locked door in those days. The happiest days of my life. I was born to be here on that moment of history to contribute to Israel's survival. And that's the most important thing I did in my life. We have a great word in Yiddish, it's beshert. It's fated, it's meant to be. Maybe God spared us in World War II so that we could come to Israel and help the remnants of our people survive. Shortly before I left Israel, they happened to be in Tel Aviv when they were bringing in refugees from the death camps in Europe. I remember them getting down on their hands and knees and kissing the ground. I knew then and there that was the reason that I came.
so long. We'd love to hear your prayer and, and everyone's thoughts on, on the documentary. Doris, I'm looking at you. And I think this might have been your first time actually watching it. I'd love to get your thoughts on that as well. It's amazing. Thank you for bringing all this to our attention, Jamie, and certainly gives us all great pride. To be Jewish and pride in the country of Israel. Yeah. Hey, Alana, would you mind uh, pausing that the movie for a minute? Thank you, buddy. So, uh, I, I don't know how we stumble on this, but this is just an incredible documentary. I hope you all got a lot out of it. And and so, in in research and prep for this, I I, I googled a lot of the, the the names of the pilots and those of their families. So while unfortunately a lot of the pilots are no longer around, uh, families still are. So if it's uh, something you're ever interested in, in looking at, I can definitely send out a a a document that can show you know who's around still um and even reach out to the family members to say hey look we watched this and your family made a difference pretty cool and uh even on linkedin or whatever it may be right so uh the the journey's not done we're just finding additional people but we want to conclude this uh this beautiful evening with the lawn and the four doors buddy Thank you, Jamie. Again, thank you so much to you, to our entire Mensch Club committee for bringing this incredible film to us, and um, and really uh, having the having the foresight to realize the importance of having this program here. Obviously, none of us could have ever anticipated the the timing of this particular program, and. Um, and 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 while uh, while we had wanted to share this program, my goodness, it feels like almost a month ago when uh, when we were celebrating when we were celebrating the Yom Ma'ut and celebrating the state of Israel and the formation of the state of Israel and and the anniversary of that Israel's birthday. Um, it seems almost more appropriate that we were able to share this today. Um, this historic day, this, uh, this very important day when, um, when a, uh, a ceasefire was agreed to in the state of Israel, when Israel is once again, um, we pray in peace after 11 days of horrible, horrible fighting and, um, and uh, being of, of, of needing to call upon our troops again. And I want to share, I want to start by sharing this prayer for peace for the state of Israel. This was this uh, written by Rabbi Ofer, um, Rabbi Ofer Sabbath Beit Halachmi. And he writes, please, with the great force of your right hand, Spread over the protectors of our land the canopy of your peace. Lift your hand over them. Save them from all enemy and ambush, from all bullets that threaten their souls. Give them strength and heart to distinguish between enemy and lover, between the people of wickedness and the people of Abraham. Please, with the great force of your right hand, guard the state of Israel, our eternal homeland, for the sake of exalting your name among all the inhabitants of the world. Please with force, please without use of force. My father was one who ran away from high school in 1948 to fight in the War of Independence. And, um, and I know that that was always a source of great pride. He raised us to be proud of both the country in which we were born, the United States of America, and the country that was born of our family and of our friends' families, and that was the state of Israel. 
We were raised to know that Hatikva, the national anthem of the state of Israel, was not just a national anthem, but was a prayer. A prayer that we should always have hope, that we should always know that there is hope in this world. And that we as Jews should always know that there is safety and protection and that that hope, that hope that our guest tonight, Mordechai, fought so valiantly for, that hope that these heroes in this film fought so valiantly for, that that hope is just as alive today for our children as it will be for our children's children and our children's children's children. We pray. We pray that Hatikva, as we sing it together now to close our program tonight, we pray that Hatikva will be words that motivate us, that remind us of our love, and also remind us of our responsibility. Our responsibility to hope for something better at all times. To hope that there can be peace. To hope that all peoples who live within the borders of the state of Israel should know that they can live together in peace. And so we join together in these, in these words. And this beautiful melody. peace, knowing that there is peace once again in the state of Israel. May we all have a night of rest, knowing that others can rest because they feel safe and protected because the state of Israel exists. And may we always be grateful to those who gave their lives, who gave their strength, who gave their commitment so that the state of Israel could exist for all of us. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Doris. And thank you to our entire Mensch Club committee for making this program happen here tonight. And to all of you, because without people coming to programs, programs don't actually happen. So uh, to all of you for being here and joining us on Zoom, thank you again. Any closing words, Jamie or Doris? Ilan? Yes. Uh, am I on? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Zurika. Good. It's so good to see you. Uh, thank you. It, it was a very touching program, and I love your closing words. But I'd like to add, and I would like to add a couple of things, that the, the movie talks about people who got up and did something because they believed in something and they risked their lives and they risked everything about them to be committed to something that was important and not to be victims the way we were during the Holocaust. And 
I think that what I, I have done personally, and I would like to ask you and encourage you to, no matter what side of the political, whether you are Republican or a Democrat, or it doesn't matter what you are, call your congressman, your senator, and thank them, and thank them, and stand for, up for Biden for what he has done, and thank him for what he has done. Again, both sides of the party, doesn't matter who you are, make that call because it matters. It really matters. So I want to thank you and please ask all of us to do that and encourage your friends to do that. It's important. Thank you, Zarika. That's those are important words. And, and you're right. Words are not enough. Our actions must follow and we must show our gratitude and make those calls and uh, and let our let our elected leaders know that we appreciate their support. And uh, thank you, Sarika. Excellent words. Thank you. And Carol, thank you for sharing. Uh, Carol just shared in the chat. I, I keep forgetting that everyone can't see the chat. Only I can. Um, that her dear late Jack, uh, her dear late husband Jack, also fought as a member of the Palmach to establish the state of Israel, um, as he was a member of our synagogue. Uh, we, we want to actually mention Jack as well, and that Jack was one of my father's very dear and close friends. So um, so it's wonderful to be able to remember Yankala tonight as well. And, uh, and, and Ilan, I think Mordechai has some closing yeah, Mordecai, words. If he, like he wants to say it. something. Great. Mordecai, you watch Fantastic. the video. What are your thoughts? Oh, you got to get the microphone yeah, open, though. here for tonight and the wonderful program you organized. It was wonderful. Thanks so much for the invitation. <laughs> Thank you, Mordechai, for being with us. <laughs> Are you kidding? Uh. Mordechai, thank you. Great program. Thank you all for sharing and including Heritage Point. We uh, are indebted for, to you for forever. Thank you. Beth, Beth, Heritage Point is welcome at any of our programs. Please always know that all of our programs that are on Zoom, um, if you would like to reach out to our, uh, if, if you would like to reach out to our, um, our temple administrator, she would be happy to get you on our email list and you would be able to know about any programs that we have going on Zoom. And please feel free to always share those with Heritage Point. We would love to have we, you. We would, Ilan, we would love to. We have over 170 residents other than Mordechai who right. would really love to indulge in, in what we saw tonight. So thank you. And we will do that. And, and, and we also look, as we close this out, we look forward to the time when we can get in person at some point together, respectfully distance and all that, whatever that may look like. But uh, we started this as an idea of sharing stories. And that's how it started. George, you, st you shared your story last time. Boy, that was incredible. So uh, thank you, George. Uh, thank you, Mordecai. And we will continue this. So you guys are just awesome. And I'm just honored and humbled to just be a facilitator of this. So thank you, Alon. Thank you, Doris. Thank you. Uh, you're the mensch on the bench, Doris. Although, yeah, I don't think because <laughs> she's the one that nags everyone. Hey, you get this done, you're doing it all. So, Doris, you're awesome. We love you. And, uh, Alon, thank you, everybody. Have a good thank night. Thank you, all, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Great job, everybody. Yeah. We enjoy it. Laila Tov Mordechai, do Bari, Dao Balacha. Laila Tov. Mordechai, thank you so much. Thank you. She said thank you. They said all said thank you very much. Okay, I appreciate very much. And the history, like I said before, is very important. Thank you. So everybody. right. So right. Thank you, Mordechai.
I'll visit you when I come to Heritage Point, Mordechai. I'll visit you when I'm there. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and Doris, you. and Doris, obviously you can get uh, you can get Beth connected with yes. Harry so that they'll yeah. know because our okay. programs will continue. You know, I would think things like our Cantor's Corner and things like that would be programs that would be of such interest to the Heritage Point res residents because it's just music and conversation. And, uh, you know, these are these are great opportunities to to be able to reach out and and bring some joy have the honor of sitting on their board, so I will definitely make sure they're connected. Oh, uh, that's wonderful. I didn't know about that. That's great. If if anybody does Talmud study, Mordechai is a Talmudic scholar. Ah. So, but he, he seems to have a love of that, even though he tells me, no, 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 it's in the past. <laughs> <laughs> Mordechai is also a graduate of the Technion. Oh, wow. And I think that, uh, oh, he's already gone, but I think Ken Picard at one point uh, was at the Technion, if I'm not mistaken. Or or maybe he was at the Weizmann Institute, but I'm not sure. Um, I, I taught at the Barry, Technion also. Barry, you knew Al Schwimmer, didn't you? Yes, I did. I worked for Israel Aircraft from 1969 to 1973. Yeah. It's amazing. And I taught at the Technion while I was there as well. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. A long, beautiful finish to the program. Thank you, George. I just read the script that you wrote me. <laughs> you don't need a script. You don't need a script. That's for yeah, sure. It sounds so much like Elon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you for joining us, Jean. Thank you so much. Jean, if you see my daughter, say hello. Yeah, you see Lisa. Oh, I will, definitely. I text with her a lot. She's very good. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. Okay. So. Yolanda and Doris, how is Susan 